Hello and welcome once again to Bulldogs Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game. Some special guests this week, including one of our players involved in the Harvey Normans New South Wales Women's Premiership Final. So that'll be a big game coming up on the weekend. More on that later in the show. And, of course, Dog Days is going to be very interesting too. But right now with Luke Goodwin, we'll do our regular chat about the week that was and the week that's coming up. And firstly, Luke, uh, I guess we look at the team list and there's one very, very big change, which is going to really ignite the Bulldogs fans, I reckon. Yeah, it's um, you know, unfortunate for, for one person. But, yeah, um, this week Josh Reynolds will be starting. Um and Kyle Flanagan's been put back to New South Wales Cup. So, yeah, massive change for the club. Look, Kyle's obviously got some work to do. Let's see where that goes. Yep. But in terms of Josh coming on, I know it's not an emotional decision. We know how popular he is, but I think the coaching staff, particularly Cameron Serraldo, have been very careful about this, haven't they? And clearly they feel like he's got enough Ks in his legs now to run 80 minutes. Yeah, they haven't rushed him. They've um, you know started him in in the New South Wales Cup, then gave him some time off the bench. So he's definitely built up um, his legs and, and the Ks we need to get in his legs. So there's definitely – that has happened. Um, he's a totally different player to Kyle. I know he'll bring a lot of energy um, and really, you know, bolster the team. Um, you know, the last couple of weeks we've been lacking a bit of that, I believe. Um, you know, there's a, a few actions that we like on the field that, that require no ability. And one of them is, is um, you know, enthusiasm and energy. And, and I'm sure Josh will bring that in, in loads on the weekend against the Dragons. Well, while you're on that point, there's a number of things I wanted to work through looking at the last three results. There's actually some positives out of it as well. But just on that point you made, and that is we've got a high error count. There's no doubt about that. We've talked about that in other shows. But it's basically how you defend errors that really defines a lot of teams. And unfortunately, after a couple of errors or bad calls, it might even be, the team has conceded not only one try, but sometimes more than one. Uh, the other teams have scored in bursts. We particularly saw that with South, and we saw it again to a smaller degree yeah. against the Sharks. Yeah, no, I know it's been spoken about. Um, and when we got new, you got to remember where you got a new coach, we've got new players, new systems and processes in place. So it's not going to happen overnight. Mm. Um, we are getting better at it. Um, the stats do show us that. But you're right. Like on the weekend, you know, he scores his first try, the young halfback from the Sharks, then scores in the next set of six. Um, and it was off nothing. It was off a kick, but you know, there was no one back there helping Hayes. Um, so, yeah, you're right, Bill, and that's something. You know, we had an extended um, session, uh, video session this morning that we ran through a lot of stuff. One thing I did like, though, you look at a player like Ryan Sutton, and, and he had a drop ball, but he came charging back and said, I want to do the next run. Yeah. I want to make the next run. They're the kind of guys you want in your team. Even if they're not having a good day, they never give up. No, nah, 100%. Um, he's a well-liked lad, Sutter. I, I really like him. Um, he's not the only one ever to have made an error, by the way. I'm just yeah. pointing that out because I thought it really – it really stuck out for me in a, in a game where we were, you know, struggling at times. Well, at eighteen fourteen down at half time, Billy, we thought we were a massive chance. Mm. They spoke about it at half time, and then, you know, we come out in the second half, and and we we're really flat. Um, we thought we should have, you know, started a lot better, a lot quicker than we did, and then, you know, it was a bit disappointing. So with ten minutes to go, um, you know, we we're all, all over them. We we're finishing on top of them. So it's a shame we we couldn't start like that. Straight after the halftime break, um, yeah. But yeah, the, yeah. The boys spoke really honestly this morning, so um, I'm a bit excited about this weekend. It's it's intriguing, and and it's mm. going to draw a lot of fans. So you make sure you get to the game. I know it won't be easy for Bulldogs fans. We'll get to that in a minute. But post contact meters in the game against Cronulla, massive difference. They had 137 more post contact meters. Uh, tackle breaks, 35 to 20. Yeah. So a lot of issues there. Offloads. 13 to 4. I guess got to get more out of that if you can. Where's Terry Lamb? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's so hard, Bill, to defend against some second, good second phase play. Yeah. And you have a look at the tries we scored. It come off some offloads and us playing a bit more footy. Mm. Um, but you can only do that when um, you defend. And once you're defending, you know, more sets of six than you should, you're going to get fatigued. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you go away from playing the footy and that we know we can. At least against Cronulla. And I think this is – 
we must point this out because we, we have had a, a bit of a whinge the last couple of weeks. <laughs> there were no complaints about the refereeing against Cronulla. There were no controversial calls or sin binnings or anything like that. Interestingly, the momentum was all basically about how the teams played, really. Yeah, you're right. Um, and I'm not going to say this was a, a bad call, but, you know, I don't blame the ref sometimes because you don't know, you know, we struggle, we speak about it frequently on this program, about the rules, um, you know, when I think the fullback scored his hat trick, you know, someone ran through inside shoulder. and the obstruction and, play, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, the next night um, Moses did it and he gets penalised and, <laughs> you know, and, and it's not a try. So it's just hard to keep up with those rule changes as, as an inch either way. So, yeah, do we believe Cole could have made a bit more effort? Yeah, could have been still a try? Maybe, but... Yeah, it's, as long as they're consistent. Um, but sometimes I think even they get confused. And the other thing too, we've talked about in a previous show how the ranks have been thinned out a bit, the talent distribution yeah. because of the Dolphins for one. But when you've got a stack of injuries like we've had, I've, I've really felt like the bench has done very well considering there's not a lot of experience uh, in that in that depth of 17, if you know what I mean. Uh, I yeah. felt like our interchange has really worked well under the circumstances. Yeah, well, you look at the team we had, like I think round two, three, four, we had an international forward pack sitting on the sideline yeah. and a big chunk of our salary cap. So, you know, we speak about it and I know, you know, uh, us as staff and, and we speak about how well we have been doing with the plays we've been putting on mm. and they've been excellent. And so there's massive opportunities, um, you know, for the plays. I thought, you know, Declan Casey and Braden Burns were excellent on the weekend, you know, taking their opportunity. Um, when, you know, even though, you know, you got Josh and Carazza, probably two of our better players, but these guys, you know, went mm. well. So there's opportunity for any, every, every player now that steps in and, you know, um, young Curtis Morin comes onto the bench this week too again and, and he plays well above his weight, Curtis. He's got a high work rate. So there's opportunities at this club for all players if they're, they're willing to listen and, and roll the sleeves up, bit of hard work. Some teams have had a lot more luck with injuries <laughs> than we have, it must be said, and that's why they're up near the other end of the ladder. But what's the benchmark round for us to get most of our players back, assuming hopefully that we don't have any more of these horrible injuries? Yeah, I think between round 10 and round 12. Right. Um, it looks like, yeah, so Karaz, a couple of weeks off, you know, the Fox, he tells me he's ready next week. <laughs> We're looking at probably another three to four there. Uh, Luke Thompson, the same, Chris Patalo. You know, um, two to three. So, yeah, mm. we're, we're getting there, Bill. It's a bit exciting because they're all back running now. Even the Fox is doing a little bit of running, um, you know, on the Ultra G. So, yeah, it's a bit exciting. And there's no excuses. I know there's never excuses at this club. But in those three weeks we've talked about, we've played last year's preliminary finalists, yeah. last year's grand finalists, and last year's second-place team in the minor premiership. Uh, they happen to go out in straight sets, but nevertheless a very good side. And the form around those games from all those teams yeah. has been very strong. So oh. you've got to put it in perspective. Yeah, either side of of us playing them, you know, they've been, you know, had convincing wins. You know, look at South beating, the you know, the premiers on the weekend. So, yeah, it is a good measuring stick. Uh, can we get better? Yes. Are we improving? Yes. And we will get there. Next mission is the Dragons. Uh Interesting little stat. The Dogs have won five of seven against the Dragons in Wollongong. Josh Reynolds has won 11 of his 12 games against the Dragons, according to our stats man, Darren Andrews. I, I, I would assume maybe a couple of those would be for the Tigers. I don't know. But uh, in, interesting stat, that. So yeah. funnily enough, it's come up in this, uh, in this week where he's got, the, he's got a starting spot. Yeah, well, that's a great stat. I wonder if I Cam don't... thought that was the deciding factor. <laughs> <laughs> he's big on his stats. It could be. Uh, but no, that's yeah, no, that's interesting, especially down there. You know, you it's like us. You want to make you know your home ground a fortress. So yep. that's pretty pretty good by by us. Um, and we hopefully it rings true on the weekend. My favourite part of the Dragons games at Wollongong was the helicopter ride to Win Stadium back in the old days of TV when we flew in choppers, and boy was that fun. But anyway, that's another story. It's <laughs> channel not really, Ten, yeah, back in the yeah. Channel Ten chopper days, yeah, that was great. I'm going back a lot of years now, like. Late 80s, early 90s. Was anyone born then? <laughs> anyway, uh, thoughts on that game against St. George Illawarra? Because they've obviously got their own set of problems. They're another yep. team that's been in the headlines a lot. I can't believe, I can't believe the open media chat about the coaching position. It's astounding. And whatever you think of Hook as a coach, as a person, you wouldn't want him to go through that. But anyway, that's rugby league. 
It, it is, unfortunately, and, um, yeah, it's the nature of our game. It's not great. Um, you know, there's lives at stake here. And, but at the end of the day, it's all about wins and losses, isn't it? Mm. That's how, how we're measured. I know everyone in this organisation's measured. So, uh, yeah, it's tough. Uh, look, there's probably a lot of stuff we don't know, Bill, that, go, as you know, being involved with at the Bulldogs now, there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Mm. Um, so we can only listen to what we know and what's what we read about o- online and in the paper. But, yeah, it's, um, it's not great when, you know, straight away they say we're going to take – you know, applications in for the job next year and, and you know, is, the season's yeah. not even a quarter of the way through. So I do feel for him. I do feel for him, but, you know, he's experienced enough. He understands um, the business of the of rugby league, unfortunately. Um, yeah, but I do feel for him for sure. If anything, it makes the Dragons a team to be wary of this coming weekend, but a big opportunity for the Bulldogs. Uh, Luke Goodwin, thank you so much. And we'll have lots more from Bulldogs Unleashed. Stick around for some very interesting guests. Uh, my name's Braden Burns and I play for the Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs. I love playing footy because um, obviously I've played it since I was a kid. Yeah, the fans are obviously really important to every footy player. We go out and we play for the fans and the members especially. You hear um, the fans obviously when they're giving it to you on the sideline. As a young kid I was pretty easily influenced and um, I sort of got into gambling a little bit, not too bad, but um, I guess it just takes away from the game. You don't sort of sit there and watch the game for what it is and enjoy those special moments and, and sort of support your team. You're more worried about your multis. Yeah, I'm really proud that the Bulldogs as a partner would reclaim the game. Um, I'm someone who, who's sort of gotten off betting. I'm really proud to say that um, that's something that I'm sort of walked away from and um, I'm proud to be a part of it. Don't let a bet take you away from the match. Reclaim the game. Be gamble aware. This week's headlines. Welcome back to Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game. And our special guests this week are one of the... Harvey Norman Women's Premiership Players, who's competing in the grand final for the Bulldogs this week. Georgia Ravix, thanks for joining us, Georgia. Thanks for having me. And also one of the classic Bulldogs players, one of the most popular ever to pull on the blue and white, <laughs> Dean Hallitow. Really good to be here, mate. And I'm not Georgia. just saying that because you're here, mate. Yeah. Don't worry. I, mean, I say that about everybody, but I'm only kidding. All right, let's talk firstly, though, about Harvey Norman's Women's Premiership. Uh, Georgia in the grand final this weekend, and we might talk a bit about grand final preparations because – you might get some advice from this bloke. <laughs> yeah. he, he has actually won one. Now, maybe more when he was a junior and that, but anyway, he has won in, in the uh, NRL. Uh, Georgia, firstly, what an amazing season it's been for the Harvey Norman Women's Premiership. Really close competition and third versus fourth in the granny. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, from the very start we've been extremely competitive and every team we've played has definitely put their, their best team on the park against us and it, it's definitely been a competition every single week. So to... Um, to make it to the grand final this week is definitely, um, you know, a credit to, I guess, all the hard work we've put in in the off-season. Every every team kind of was coming after us from the get-go. So it's nice to to be able to be be in the position to, to play the, the final game of the season. So, yeah, it's been great. The top six separated only by two wins uh, in yeah. the premiership. You don't see that every day. Absolutely not. It was it was extremely close. And even the semi final, there was an upset. Obviously, fourth took out first place. So, mm. um, just shows that yeah, semi final footy is definitely very different to to the round games. You took on the Steelers in the semi final last weekend, sixteen eight. That was a, a tough game. Yeah, absolutely. I think the um the first half we were really giving it to each other. It was really close up, right up until to half time and we kind of got in the sheds and and spoke about our game plan we were giving away a lot of penalties and that's something that we've kind of done a lot this year so um the second half we we came out with with a bit more purpose and and stuck to our game plan and you know the last 10 minutes I think the the bulldog kind of came out in everyone and got a bit fiery but it was um yeah it was it was awesome and and when that buzzer went I think everyone was just relieved and and grateful to to be off to the next one. (laughs) Now, we'll talk in more detail about Dean's grand final experiences uh, a little later in the show. But, Dean, what's your advice for Georgia? Because you've been there and done that. And I guess there's always a temptation when you get to this level of the game. And if you've got a few things, as Georgia said, that you're still working on, like the error count, for example, or penalties, how much do you want to change before a game like this? I, I suppose it's hard, yeah. But when, you, when you've spent uh, a good part of the year working on your game and, and you get to this point and things are still happening the way they've been happening, you, you can't really click your fingers and make it. Um, or set it right within a few days. But I would say the best advice is just to, to go with what's worked for the, for the entire season, what's got you here. And obviously taking out the Steelers last week, whatever you took into that game, the attitude that you took in, it's, it's really important to, to focus on those things. But 
Uh, one thing that probably got the better of me in grand final week was the occasion. I let the occasion mm. sort of get the be- better of me, I think, in my preparation, which made me nervous going into the game. So I think if you can park the fact that it is a grand final and, and focus on just being another game, it, enjoy what it is, but mm. at the same time try and uh, try and block out as much of the noise as possible and, and just work on what, what you've been doing in terms of your preparation. Has that been the focus this week? You've got a couple of pretty experienced people in the coaching staff. Yeah, we definitely do. Sandy's, um, you know, even though he says to us it, it's not just another game, we still need to repair like it is another game. And it, exactly like you said, there's a lot of hype around it and, you know, there's a, a lot of, um, you know, family's excited, your friends are excited, a lot more people are coming to watch and not to let that get in your head, very similar to, to what you said. So um, <clears throat> we've got a big session on Wednesday um, which will kind of set the tone, I guess, for the rest of the week and then light session Friday and then, yeah, straight into the game Saturday. But, um, yeah, no, I think the general consensus is exactly that. Don't let it kind of get in your head that it is obviously such a big occasion. I'll mention it again uh, a little later, but three grand finals for the Bulldogs at Leichhardt Oval on Saturday. Harold Matthews Cup, they're playing the Knights at 12.45, then at 4.15 the Tasha Gale Cup. Boy, there's some pace in that Tasha Gale team. I've seen some of the highlights of the season with the tries they've scored. They are very quick. They're playing the Roosters Indigenous Academy. And then the main event at 6 p.m. is Harvey Norman's Women's Premiership. And Bulldogs playing the Mounties. As I said, it's uh, the Mounties were fourth. You finished third, but it was all so close anyway. It was A lot of it came down to, to points difference. But uh, how do you feel about that particular team? Yeah, I guess for us, we haven't, uh, I guess, played that team as, as a full strength side. So we um, <clears throat> we have a lot of preparation to do this week in regards to what the game plan is. The Steelers are obviously very strong in their backs, whereas Mounties, they're definitely a middle, middle pack kind of um, team. So their strength is in the middle. So it's a bit of a different game plan to, I guess, what we had last week. So a few whiteboard sessions this week to get our get our game plan under wraps. But, um, yeah, they'll definitely be tough and they'll, they'll come out fighting especially in the middle. They've they've quite a solid um, solid pack. So, um, yeah, our forwards will, will be ready to <laughs> ready to go into battle for us, that's for sure. Rob Roll, are you going to play that on the wing? How involved are you going to get? Yeah, exactly. We'll have to come <laughs> in. My job is obviously to come in when our forwards have been working hard and then take those first few hit-ups. So I'll be, um, I'll be taking them on at some point, definitely. <laughs> yeah, well, they're going to be pretty tight at some stage. There's an yeah, advantage you can take care of. Exactly. Tell me, uh, th- we've got an expanded NRL. LW competition and we'll deal with that in a moment because Dean you've had a bit to do with that obviously um, as head of operations with the NRL but I, I'm also seeing the standard of the Harvey Norman competition is rising with the level of the NRLW if anyone hasn't had a chance to see it at that level you'd be quite surprised and a lot of the NRLW players are playing in it anyway um, you've signed up with a team for, for the NRLW season congratulations on that but it has been a very high standard, very intense competition. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, just like you said earlier, the top six were only separated by a couple of points. So the talent is definitely spread quite evenly amongst the teams. And, you know, each team obviously have quite a few superstars. We have a couple in our team um, and a lot of girls that have played NRLW. And I think this competition is becoming the benchmark to be signed, obviously. And, you know, I'm definitely lucky enough to be in that position myself. However, you know, it, it really shows that the, the game is growing and the talent is there and um, for the girls to be able to play in this competition and be, be scouted by the NRLW coaches, it, it is amazing. So um, as this comp continues to grow, obviously the better this comp gets, the better NRLW will be. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's been awesome. When you factor in Queensland, um, Dean, uh, I, I think the NRL, we've seen the emergence of a number of very good football women's competitions um, in in the last few years, particularly AFLW and NRLW have grown very strongly uh, as opposed to the entrenched women's sports like netball and basketball, etc. But um, the, the number of women playing those, those uh, sports now, and I, I think when you compare them, and I've said this before, the NRL has probably left us wanting more a bit when it comes to the women's rugby league competitions, but in the end, uh, when they've delivered, we've got an expanded competition again this year, the standard is already there. Uh, it, we're not growing into these clothes. We're, we're actually wearing them comfortably. Yeah, well, I, I, I watch a fair bit of women's uh, sport and uh, watching the AFLW, uh, watching Super Rugby W as well. I, I, I am biased, but I think the NRLW is the best product in the women's sport that, that's on TV that we get to see uh, as a um, Premier League. And uh, I've, I've enjoyed... The growth in the game because and georgie might be able to answer this better but i think as 
the expansions happened at the NRLW level. We've seen participation grow at the junior level and mm. um, they've tracked really well in terms of their development skill-wise. Uh, the, the tightness of the competitions at the lower grades as well has, has improved and, and I think that's flowed on to the NRLW. That's why we're seeing such a good product up the top. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it also comes back to a lot more people want to get into the women's space and, you know, obviously behind good players, are obviously good coaches and good good staff so um there's a lot more driving factors behind how the girls are able to produce this quality of of talent um you know people are getting behind the women's game and they're wanting to be involved because that's what they want to be involved in it's not just uh you know wanted to be involved in the men's but now i'm just involved in the women's it's kind of their their driving factor is that they actually want to back the women's sport and i think that's the the main difference and uh the creativity uh, of a lot of the players too. It's, yeah. It's um, – I don't know, Dean. You, the, the men do get – and a, a lot of this has to do with the evolution of coaching I think as well. And and you see a lot of this sort of in, in junior football regardless of whether it's men's or women's. But um, the men can be very structured, can't they? Whereas you still see a lot of creative ad-lib football in the women's game. And it, it's funnily enough, it's something we're crying out for a bit I think in the men's game a lot. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think um, one, one thing that I've – I know Luke, you coach pretty well, and I know a number of uh, a number of coaches in in the female version of the game. And uh, one of the things that they often say to me is that women are a lot more easy to work with in terms of learning. Uh, and of I'm not we are. I'm not too sure why that is, but um, you're not going to get the argument. Here. <laughs> but but that, that that willingness to take on new information, and and I think um, we're always seeing uh, innovation at, at the women's level, and and willing to throw the ball around a bit more and, and be less structured. Uh, like you said, it, it is. The NRL can be overstructured at times and there's an obsession with getting to spots on the field and getting through sets and, and going by the playbook. But mm. I think uh, there's encouragement in the female game to to throw the ball around because the skill development is at that, at that level. Uh, I just want to ask too, um, the relationship that you've seen between, say, touch football and, uh, and I'm talking Oztag as well as touch um, as a stepping stone to Harvey Normans and NRLW, you mentioned earlier Super W, Dean, and of course rugby's had a little bit of a conflict there in the women's side of things because women's sevens in rugby has been so successful, particularly since winning an Olympic gold medal. So a lot of women were preferring to play sevens perhaps and not the 15-a-side game, uh, but that seems to have found a nice balance now or getting there. What about the relationship between touch or tag and uh, and the NRLW? Yeah, I think it just gets people involved earlier. So, you know... I think sometimes parents are a little bit um, a bit concerned about maybe their children playing contact sport. However, you know, initially you get the kids involved and, and they're, they're learning to love the game from an early age, whether it be touch football or tag. And then I guess as they, as they get older, they progress into the, the contact side of things. And I think um, the skills that they learn at the young age, playing touch or even playing tag, you know, you really can transition those into to rugby. It does give kids uh, that option. Uh, the boys are the same. Yeah. The boys will often start playing touch. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to know because my, my daughter, she's uh, she's 14. She's playing under 16's league tag, but she's comfortable playing league tag. She's not sure about how she makes that transition over to contact. So any mm. advice from my 14-year-old uh, daughter? <laughs> um, uh, I think it's definitely a confidence thing. And, you know, obviously when, when you first start out, you might be a little bit nervous, but it's – it's just a confidence. You just have to be confident, and you have to just go in. It's, you're not going to get hurt. <clears throat> it's when you're it's when you're not confident that you that you do get hurt. So just get the tackle bags out and, and give it a go. I say. <laughs> Georgia Ravix, Dean Hallatow in the sheds coming up. Stay with us on Unleashed. Let's go in the sheds. Welcome back to Bulldogs Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game. Our special guest, the Georgia Ravix, is in the. Harvey Norman Women's Premiership Grand Final this weekend for the Bulldogs against Mounties. Big game coming up at Leichhardt Oval. Big array of football. The Bulldogs heavily involved in that day too. So get down to Leichhardt Oval. And a bloke who's played a bit at Leichhardt Oval actually, as well as at Belmore, is the great Dean Hallitower. Thank you both for joining us this week. Dino, we're going to start this with you actually because I want to know whether the NRL Manager of Football Review and Operations is just some flashy title they gave you to sit in the office and put your feet up or are you actually doing some stuff? No, I, think, I think the title is officially a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the titles are pretty flashy. The better they sound, the more important you sound when you say it to people and when you see it online and you can uh, put it in your script. So, um, 
Yeah, look, essentially I look after the injury surveillance bunker, which uh, right. over the past two seasons has become particularly um, topical with our independent doctors making decisions yeah. from the bunker. So I manage the the casual workforce that operates the technology, also that um, spots the game. So we've got spotters on every game uh, and also the independent doctors, I sort of I manage them, uh, they're contractors to the, to the NRL. But um, I look after that, that space. That goes from um, setting them up every week on every match to uh, reviewing – Matches to looking at all the data that comes out of every game, so it's 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 uh, the title probably doesn't even actually reflect the the work that I do, but um, it keeps me busy enough. It, it's a really interesting it part of the flash. game. <laughs> it, 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 it's um well, there are still some old hard heads uh, who who probably are a bit I don't know conflicted about the whole HIA thing, but surely the step towards independent doctors did solve a few arguments. How do you think it's going? Oh look, there's been there's been a few hiccups along the way, look, which which is going to be with anything that's new. Uh, the injury surveillance program itself has been around since 2014-15. So there was uh, on the sideline monitors that um, brought up every camera angle that you could see mm. um, as a, as a broadcast, uh, and uh, we had technology we use Hawkeye technology that um, is able to replay those angles for um, an operator. Um, in in this case, at a ground back in the old version. The team doctor could come up and have a look at an incident that just happened on the field. It was instantaneous. They could bring it back up, go over it. Now that's evolved to um, having spotters operate from the bunker. We now only have a screen at the field. So what we used to have was a computer set up in a tent at the field. Now it's just a screen uh, and everything's done similar to what happens with the review officials, like the match review, uh, Mm -hmm. sorry, the match officials. Everything's done in the bunker. It shoots through to the the monitor on the side of the field. Um, We've got the independent doctors now able to make a call on whether a player should come off. Mm. Um, But essentially, it's still a support service for the clubs. The club doctors are making the decisions around their players. Um, We're there to try and identify ones that potentially could be missed. Um, So it's a support service. But having qualified doctors in the bunker enables us to – if there's something that's viewed that – um, indicates there could be a potential concussion, then we can make a decision to take it from the field. So, look, it's it's a necessary um, tool that that we use to make sure we're looking after the players as best as possible. Yeah, and look, you'd have to be a little bit naive to not understand why all this is happening. I mean, we've only got to look at cases mushrooming all over the world in various football codes with players, former players, suing clubs and associations and all sorts of things. So... All the codes now have a responsibility which they have to fulfil. It's it's basically a it's it's almost a legal obligation, isn't it these days? And I don't want to get you tied up with all that, <laughs> but it is it is a very important component of it. Georgia, what about in the women's game? I mean, um, how, how does that system work with with HIA, for example? Yeah, I guess for us it comes down to um, our trainers that come onto the field and obviously assess assess each person if they're in that situation. It really comes down to the player themselves and. Um, at our level, we need to ensure that we're being honest with our feedback and, you know, they were very, our trainers were very clear with us from the beginning of the season that it's in our own best interest that we're honest. We don't just say that we're okay because we want to finish the game. You know, our, our well-being is much more important than, than a game of footy and I think, you know, it, it, it leads from the top down and if that's what the NRL are doing and that's how serious they're taking it, I think it really it comes down all the way down to the grades to really understand that that is really important and, and we need to take it really seriously. And it'll take a lot longer for the culture of the game to change than it has for the technology to change. In other words, the really younger players, the new ones coming through, will probably have less of that sense of guilt and obligation to stay on the field that is traditional in this game and... Uh, Maybe that will help, I think. You talked about the player being very important there, what their feedback is, mm. uh, and not and not tell fibs. Yeah, but exactly. Back in the day, the old guys, you know, at the top level of the game anyway, it, 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 they've said it before on this show, it was a badge of honour if you stayed on, even if you were, you know, just about unconscious. Yeah. I, I'm pleased to hear you say that, Georgia, because yeah. like, I used to work in the wellbeing and uh, education team and part of that role was yep. – delivering um, workshops to, to players at, at all levels. And uh, the big message around concussion is be honest with yourself uh, because you have to look after yourself. And, and, and it used to be that mentality mm. that you talk about, Bill, where um, you don't want to let your team down and it's a badge of honour if you take a hit and you get up and you carry on for your team. But um, if, if you want to look after the most important asset in your body, your brain, then yeah. um, you've got to be honest with yourself. And, and it's great that your trainers pass that message on to you, you all and – uh, if, if we're getting that message across at the Harvey Norman Wins Premiership, then 
hopefully it's filtering through to 16, 17s to community rugby league as well because that is the most important thing. And the other thing is too, even even if you look at it at the most clinical level, you're actually reducing your asset value to the team if you tell fibs and stay on because long term you will actually be out of the game a lot quicker than other players. So if you're honest and up front, get off the field, take a rest for the next round, you'll probably play more footy in your career than those people who don't. Yeah, 100% right. The, the You stay on the field and you risk further injury. Um, reaction time slows down when you when you potentially suffer from a concussion, so you risk other injuries to different parts of your body. Um, you, you don't want to be out long term. You, you, you're losing um, – you're losing out a few weeks if you if you do risk that. Um, so it's a great point uh, that, yeah. Well, let's get back to professions. We've got another title here, head of retail, because Georgia actually does work for the Bulldogs. I suppose in one sense, if, if you're going to have to, and unfortunately, of course, in the women's game, you, almost all of them still have jobs, regular jobs, along with playing full-time training and everything. So if you're going to have a, a, a regular job, it helps to be with a footy club, I suppose. Although, does that mean they can keep an eye on you 24-7? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, it, it has been a, a godsend for me and I joined the club a couple of years ago now and um, at that time I was I was coming back from an injury so I wasn't playing as much footy and, and now um, to be in the space of playing footy and working for a club, I think the club obviously understand what I'm going through and where I'm at in regards to training schedules and requirements and expectations. So, um, yeah, they've been amazing in regards to letting me balance both and making sure that I can get the most out of my work and, and have a career at the same time as um, being able to, to follow my passion and play footy at the same time, which has been, yeah, amazing. But if you have that apple strudel or uh, muffin yeah. for lunch, <laughs> does anyone dob you in for, with Sandy? Oh, <laughs> honestly, sometimes, you know, the snacks in the office get a little bit out of control and I'm probably the one leading that, so it's probably not the best, but... <laughs> What what about um, uh, some of the other women? And no names, no Patriel here, but I, I guess it, it would be hard for all of them to have employers who are sympathetic to, to, to their training regime. Yeah, absolutely. You know, playing footy is, is a massive commitment. And, you know, even though we do pl- train a few nights a week, it's still getting from work to training mm. on time. And there's it, it is a massive commitment and a massive part of your life. So, um, you know, a lot of the girls haven't been able to, I guess, have full careers and they work part-time or casual to to make it work around their, their training schedule. So um, I definitely feel as though I am one of the lucky ones that is able to balance both at the moment, which has been good. But, um, but yeah, it is really hard for women. We're not in a position that we can be full-time athletes at the moment. And while the game is obviously heading in the right direction, um, we're not quite there yet. Um, so yeah, girls have to go and, and manage both and, and manage, you know, the stress of work and, and the stress of training and being selected and playing um, so yeah, it definitely add, adds a few more layers. I should quickly ask, as as your head of retail, you look after all the merchandise, basically. Um, the Anzac jersey sold well, apparently. Yeah, it was um, it was amazing. We sold out. Um, great reception online from the design, which was great. We obviously designed it in house, um, which was yeah, which was fantastic. So sold out online. We we took a few to game day, and and those last few jerseys sold quite quickly. Um, and then, yeah, the boys obviously playing in it just mm. kind of, yeah. Oh, they came that. out really well. How did you get started in rugby league? Um, I started playing rugby league when I was at school. I was probably 15 or 16 and um, the school had a, a women's team and we played and we, we had so much fun. It was, it, was, it was the best time. We have so many great memories from it. Um, and then I turned, I finished, finished school and never really um, pursued it after that. Um, and then I played AFL for a little bit a couple of years ago, just coming out of COVID and then decided that I wanted to kind of get back to, to mm. rugby league and then went down to the, the local, um, the local team that was doing like a trial, a trial game that weekend and played. And then I just kind of fell back into it a couple of years ago. So, yeah. So when they kicked to the corner. Yeah. <laughs> Do you take a two-handed mark or do you take it into your chest? Yeah, <laughs> um, two-handed mark at the moment. I'm trying to yeah, trying to work on that exactly. Take my skills from from yeah. AFL, but um, but yeah, it's been it's been good. And uh, Dean, how did you start in rugby league? Oh, uh, that's can you so remember lo- back? That's a long though? time ago. Um, <laughs> now, my, my dad played when he was young, and uh, when we when we first moved to Australia, moved to Australia when I was four years old. But when we first got here, um, he just straight away took myself and my brother to the local. Um, league team to register because he played and we were going to play. It was uh, <laughs> the Wentworthville Magpies. So it was in the Paramatacom. Oh, right. Yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, haven't 
haven't looked back since, I guess. Yeah. Uh, that was, uh, yeah, what, uh, 36 years ago odd then. <laughs> well, listen, I can go back a lot further than that. And it made me think, when you said you played in your high school women's rugby league team, back in the 60s and 70s when I was at school, there was no women's rugby league yeah. team. Women didn't have that option. Yeah. Um, small country towns too. I don't know if they've, they probably played touch footy, but that's about it, I think. So, gee, things have really changed and just as well too because um, the game's much better for it. And as I said again, like hard oval for the Bulldogs. Um, it's going to be a very big weekend this weekend. So get down there on Saturday, get there from lunchtime and just go through the whole weekend. Um, the whole afternoon, I should say. Now, I've got one more quick topic to discuss with you too, which I'd like to get the generational um, uh, perspective on. Uh, interesting story around UK soccer this week. Uh, the great Liverpool club, which I happen to be a supporter of, um, have been scrutinised for something they called a car clause. The head of their academy, which is the under-21 players, basically said that they have a contract clause which says they're not allowed to drive a flash car to training, especially if they're training with the senior players that day. Uh, if they, for any reason, have to absolutely have to have a flash car, they're not allowed to park it there. They have to park it somewhere else and walk to training or try and find alternative transport. Now, there's a few little reasons for it, but the main one is simply this, that they don't want the senior players to see a young player who hasn't proved themselves yet driving around in a flash car as if they've made it. Uh, and, the, and the motto is, you can't drive that thing until you've earned it. What are your thoughts on that? I'll ask the old guy first if you don't <laughs> <Yeah>. mind, Georgia. <laughs> I, I like it. I like it. As, uh, look, we, we probably get gu – I'm guilty of saying that young people think they're better than they are and – um, I, I probably said it towards the end of my career as I became one of the older heads. Uh, these guys think they've made it already. Often said about the, the under 18s and the under 20s, and they'd come up into first grade training, uh, throw their weight around a bit, and uh, didn't show the level of respect you think that you'd earn from them. So, and probably the generation before me said that about myself and my other teammates that came <laughs> at the same time. So, I think it's a good thing. Um, yeah, just keep them back in their place, not let them get too far ahead of themselves, and. Uh, yeah, earn, earn their way into the, the top squad. Now, obviously, Georgia, for reasons we've just discussed, the flash car comparison doesn't sort of equate yet, um, hopefully not too long away for the women's game in rugby league. But the whole notion of the younger player – you played Kezi Apps uh, in the semi final, for example, in the Harvey Normans, a player I have huge respect and admiration for. She's been so good for the women's game and she's now a senior member of this of, – of, of rugby league for women in the world, really. Um do you agree that as a younger player, you know, people should be, you know, try and keep it under wraps, especially when they're playing with or against the, 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 the seniors? I think so. I think it um I think it builds a good culture in a club if you're if you're kind of setting the expectation that if you're not there yet, don't try to shoot further than you actually are. Um and I think it's yeah, I think it's a bit more than just about the car. I think it's about the culture that the club actually wants to to breed into these young people. And I think it's important. You have to respect the players that have come before you because they've obviously – they've put in the work and they've earned that jersey before you for a reason. And, you know, I think there are some young kids that come in and, and think that they know everything and, you know, unfortunately we're always going to have that. They're all, there's always going to be those young players. But um, I think from a club perspective it's pretty funny that, you know, they've obviously got a lot of money if these young kids can <laughs> – Well, we're talking, can, <laughs> well, we're talking top grade yeah, English exactly. soccer here, so it's <laughs> a lot to of cash. A second car. That's yeah, easy. exactly. Well, yeah, I, I would think so. That's probably what they do actually. Um, uh, just And just on that, I mean, it, it, it is interesting because there's, there's a slight difference. Some players have a lot of personality and flair. Uh, that that's just their personality. So I guess you've got to be careful you don't try and squash that part of them. It's, it's, it's got to be a good balance, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, you want people to, to have a personality and, and you know, bring different different levels to your team and, and different um, strengths. So you, exactly, you don't want to crush that. But at the same time, you know, I think working through the ranks is going to make you a better player no matter what. It's probably a good example, and he's a guy that's here at the club right now, Josh Adokar. So I, would, I played with Josh at the Tigers when he was when he first debuted, and he had this um, this level of confidence that we were all a bit like, oh, come on, mate, rein it in a little bit. And he, I think in his first try, he strut after his first try, he scored in first grade. But it's a part of his personality, and anyone around here at the club mm -hmm. that sees him and the way that he that he is, it, it is it is really who he is. Is um, his energy? It's more of an energy that he brings. It's yeah. not it's not a chip on his shoulder. It's not an arrogance. It's an energy that he loves where he's at. He loves taking people on the ride with him. And I think 
when he was down at Melbourne, Melbourne, he really honed that and and directed it in a really good way. Mm. Came through in his footy, and you see nothing but personality from him. But his performances match that as well. So um, it's it's a good point. You don't want to you want to squash the, the personality or the attitude. It's it's got to be channeled the right way. I must admit, when I came to Belmore today, the first thing I did was walk around the car park and have a look. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, Georgia Ravix, thank you so much for joining us. Thank uh, you. Best of luck in the NRLW, of course, which is not far away, but more importantly for the Bulldogs this weekend against Mounties in the grand final. Good Thanks luck. very much. Thanks for having me. And, Dean, we'll be back after the break to talk about your journey with the Bulldogs and a little bit of other stuff too because the, the grand final win, unfortunately, wasn't with us, but it's still worth talking about. That's coming up in Bulldogs Unleashed. Let's talk about the dog days. Time now on Bulldogs Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game, to delve into quite an amazing career. Dean Hallitau, 249 games over 13 seasons in the NRL. And I don't know, does 249 sort of sit well with you? Some people get upset about it, but it's still a hell of a lot of games. Yeah, no, it's, uh, look, it's great. It's a, it's a great achievement, obviously, that many games, but one short of 250, it, it stings a little. <laughs> Uh, John Scandalis, when I retired, reminded me about it. Look, we we could have made the finals in my last year, and it would have. If I get if we get to the finals, yeah, it all hinged on our la- our last game. Um, we get to the finals, I'm a chance of ticking over 250, but it doesn't happen. And um, I, yeah, if that wasn't motivation for the team, I don't know what <laughs> what it is. Four positions and 115 interchange games. So you started in the centres and moved to the forwards, and I know you're quoted as saying. Um, I probably played more games in the end than I would have if I'd stayed in one position. Well, I, I guess, maybe, but the fact is that um, you had a lot of experience. Uh, how was that as a career? I, I have heard some players who are utility players do get a little frustrated sometimes because it does it does sometimes commit you to the bench because you're actually more valuable there than a starter. I'd, how, how do you feel about it? Yeah, you go through waves, I think, and, and, uh, and I, I still – think that's true that statement that I, that I made that if I wasn't a utility I probably wouldn't play test football that was I think a, a foot in the door to playing test football was yeah. that I could cover some positions and uh, it's valuable to take a touring player away that can you know fill a gap if they need if need be uh, and yeah it, it was it was great from that perspective to, to give me the opportunity to play um, plenty of games but sometimes you, you get you start playing regularly in one position you start to play some good good footy mm. and you feel really comfortable there and uh, you, you don't want to leave there and then you, know, you might get an injury somewhere else in the team so you've got to adjust and, and do what's right for the team. So you, you, you put your team hat on and you go, I'll, I'll do that. And um, I, I think it becomes a really good asset as, as a player to have that. It is. But I also take your first point that there's, there's nothing more enjoyable from a fan's perspective than seeing people who are familiar with their roles and with each other playing really sweet footy. Uh, whatever code it is. So I suppose you, you would miss that in some ways, wouldn't you? Yeah, certainly. And, and I still – I know I think about uh, my best years playing rugby league and, and my best years are when I was settled in a position and I played a lot of games mm. in that position. So so looking back that way, I think I think maybe if I had have found a position right at the outset that I locked in and I just became a career player in that position, maybe things are different. But there's no point – I'm still very happy with what I was able to achieve. So – there's no point in, in going back and forth. It is what it is. I was a utility for most part and uh, I just I guess I just got to own that. Well, we haven't got to some of those achievements yet, which we will, and, and you'll know why Dean's pretty happy if you're not familiar <laughs> with his career. But, mate, the, just getting back to, from the centres to the forwards, how was that as a move? And and the game even since then in terms of positions has changed a bit, hasn't it? They don't talk about forwards and backs that much as middles and edges and yeah. <laughs> it, it's, 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 it's different. How was it for you? Yeah, look, it was uh, – to be honest, the centres were somewhere that I ended up like j- only just before making it to grade. I was, as a youngster, played on the wing, played a bit of fullback, uh, mm. and then I, it was probably even a bit of a utility in the lower grades. Um, at the start of the 2003 season, I was playing reserve grade. I'd had a few sessions with the first grade side in the preseason, um, mm. but essentially I was I was a reserve grader and I, I started the season in the centres because there was a need and uh, I could run a hard line. It wasn't necessarily – Good footwork. I didn't have good footwork. I wasn't um, you know, the best passer, but I could, I could run a hard line wide and I had enough pace to, to cover it. So that was where I started. And then midway through the season, I, I was having a good year in reserve grade, scored a few tries and, and Sheenzy seen something in me and he thought, I'll, I'll give him a crack in, in first grade in the centre. So it was only, like I said, it was only like really a recent thing for me mm. playing centres. 
um, got into first grade and then uh, Sheenzy had recognised that I could move pretty easily and, and, and forwards were very close. And I, I think the back rowers were – no, actually, they weren't they – weren't, um, similar in size to the centers. I think I was probably undersized for a back rower back then, and um, it, it just it was just a, an option for him to move me in there and cover if I had to. Uh, so I started moving in and uh, found myself playing lock in second row, but then having to go back out if we were short in the centers. So I become a permanent forward that could cover the centers if need be. Now, um, of course, Tim Sheens. I, I I remember having quite a lot to do with him as a rugby league reporter way back, uh, late eighties, early nineties, particularly that era when Canberra was so strong. And I'd go to Canberra for a grand final week. It was almost like a regular thing there for a while. Uh, but then, of course, going right through, um, and, and uh, he was quite a senior coach, of course, in two thousand and five. What what was it like under Tim Sheens then? Yeah, look, he's a, he was someone that was always thinking about the game. He's obsessed with rugby league. And, and anyone that knows Tim and that has spent some time with Tim, uh, if you want to lock into a footy conversation with him, you've you got to block out an hour or two because – A few just, coaches are like that. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's an obsession for, for most, right? So now um, that was probably the, the first thing, his obsession with the game. But uh, he also was um, – he had a lot of purpose to, to what he delivered to us. Is, uh, everything was aimed at how we play the game and improving us as individuals. Mm. So – he was a deep thinker, uh, very innovative. He, he wanted to come up with ways that, that pushed us and that really stretched the way the game was played. And uh, he always had this this thing, if, if you practice something at training, then you could implement it in a game. And that could be John Scandalis as a front rower, putting a grubber kick in or putting a, a downtown kick in, whatever it is. Mm. Like if he, if he showed him that he was practicing that at training, then he was able to do it in the game. So he was a guy that – was really keen on developing individuals and really thorough in, in terms of the game plan that he that he delivered for us as well. Uh, a lot of that 2005 team was just so innovative and enterprising. It, the whole season was was quite remarkable, really, in a way. Um, tell us about that season and uh, and and how that team evolved. It was one of the most exciting and open seasons of rugby league we've had. No one quite knew what was going to happen next. Yeah, look, I think the, the way we played football, yeah, you're right, it was, it was very expansive, it was fast, and uh, we had some very skillful players that were able to execute some some really cool things. It wasn't just about Benji, I mean, was it? There was a whole lot of components in that team. Yeah, there was, and uh, like a, a really important part for me was was Brett Hodgson at the back. Like mm. he was, I, I always point to him as, as one of those fullbacks that sort of changed the way that fullbacks played. He was a, a spare half for us. He could, he could ball play um, really well, and he had a great kicking game. Um, but I think the, the key for us was more so the work we did off the field. And it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily uh, honing those flashy skills. It was about working hard for each other. We, we had a, an extras board up at training that um, had everyone's name listed from 1 through to 25 that was in our squad. And every week we had to fill up what we did that was extra for the team. And um, right. every week that board was full, was full. And that was something that – we could look up and know that the player next to us was doing a little bit to improve their game. And it didn't have to be um, a skill. It could be a, a fitness component. It, mm. it just had to be something that you were doing that was going to improve you as a player. Uh, and that commitment, I think, really elevated our, our attitude as a group. Um, we, we never shortcut anything. We turned up every week with that that really um, switched on um, attitude to, to prepare well. And uh, – the flashy football stuff just flowed on naturally from that hard work. And, and again, we were practicing those things at training, although some of the things that Benji could come up with, you can't practice. <laughs> Did he it's even just, know what he was doing? Yeah, sometimes? it's just, just natural. <laughs> you just had to be ready, right, as yeah. a teammate to respond or react when he did something. So I, I think that was really the key for us that year. And, and we had some really good leaders around us in, in Bengalia, Mark O'Neill, John Scandalis. Hodjo was still young but a mm. great leader. Um, Anthony Frankie was was leading as a as a young forward. Todd Payton, who's you know a lot of these guys that I speak about too are still in the game mm. because of uh, I think the things they learnt in that time. And and you beat some good sides. I mean, it, it, no one knew who was going to be in that grand final until the last week before it. Yeah, yeah, we we had a, a good run through the finals. Uh, we we dusted up the Cowboys in the first week, and but um, after that we had the Broncos and, and the Dragons and um, two sides. Like the Broncos were littered with internationals mm. and um you know they, they were a pretty uh scary side to face often because you knew that they were bringing uh physicality they were fit they had rep players they had like guys like darren Lockie and shane webke and, yeah. and the like so 
you, you always had to be ready to play your best to beat the Broncos. And then we, we faced the Dragons in the in the qualifier. That was um, a game we were expected to lose because they were one and two with power, I think, for this season. And uh, we, go, we go through the grand final because, uh, again, it, I, I, I keep going back I'll keep going back to the work we did as a team and how, how much trust we had in each other as a group. It didn't really matter, the opponent. We, we, we were looking at the bloke next to us and now we're going to do a job. Do you think there's anything to the theory that uh, injuries notwithstanding, that if you have a particularly tough finals series, that no matter how much mentally you want to be there for the grand final, that it's actually a bridge too far? Um, I, don't, I don't know whether that's necessarily the case, but you sometimes hear people saying that, you know, that the semifinals were just so gruelling or the finals were so gruelling that the grand final, they just didn't have any a lot of petrol left. I don't know. Yeah, it, it's it's a good point. Last year, the, the, the Eels, right, they were up, I think it was North Queensland the week before in the qualifying final, and they got – that was a tough match. That went um, hard, it was long, um, and – it was really tough conditions up in North Queensland. Mm. That was always going to be a tough game to bounce back off. And you think the emotion and the moment of playing in a grand final is enough to get you up. But if you're also facing a team that's experiencing the same thing, mm. now if Penrith go in fresh, fresher, I should say, um, and, and feel like they got through the week before a little less um, – with a little less fatigue and whatnot, then it's always going to be a, a tough thing. And I think Para faced that last year. And um, they're a, a really good side for – for a lot of that year, and, and I reckon it does happen uh, through through a lot of seasons. Well, I suppose testimony to that theory is that coaches value the week off now almost universally, don't they? Whereas yep. in the old days, uh, not all of the coaches did. Uh, some of them preferred to play every week. What What about um, – just before we move on to the Bulldogs, but you had an injury hit season that year too um, for, for the Tigers. Yep. That, that was pretty tough. You, you managed to get through that all right. Yeah, I had uh, I toured with my first tour with the Kiwis was was the year before, and I, I tore my um, rotator cuff in the last game of the tour, um, and it was a Tri Nations at the time. Uh, I didn't really um, know that it was a torn rotator cuff until January, so I come back, treated it as a an AC problem, um, and then in January I, I went and got an ultrasound, and I had a, a tear in my rotator cuff, which was um, a decent sized tear. Mm-hmm. Now the, the doctor at the time said, "Look, you could probably play with this if we brace it up. Um, you've got to modify your training." Uh, the alternative is you get surgery. This is in January, mind you, before a season. You can get surgery and miss six to seven months. So I took the odds to it. I said I'll, I'll, yep. um, I'll treat it, I'll brace it up, and I'll try and get through the season um, and, and see what happens. Had to have ultrasounds on it every six weeks to make sure it wasn't getting any worse. That must have been pretty scary. Yeah, it was. Thinking, but it, oh. It become routine. Like you just yeah. – as most, play, most players play with injuries. So you could feel it wasn't getting worse? Is that – yeah, oh, you know, I had the brace on most of the time. Yeah. The brace was awkward. Any player that's had a shoulder injury had to wear these braces that restrict your movement. They're, they're, they're not great to play a contact mm. sport where you're really dynamic with, but um, it just become routine. Like I just was used to doing it. Uh, I got through the season and then had surgery um, post the grand final. Actually, Benji and I both went in for surgery one, like the same day, um, <laughs> one after the other. I don't know who was first or second. I, don't know, I can't remember. But Did you manage to celebrate before the surgery though? Uh, <laughs> we did, yeah. We, we celebrated well before the surgery <laughs> and Benji kicked on post-surgery too. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us now about the Bulldogs. How did, how did that all come about? Because I, I remember as a fan um, and, you know, it's, it's funny – you want good players to come to the club, there's no doubt about it, but you do want good people. I mean, fans, I think, are much the same as coaches. Maybe, maybe not quite as um, fussy, but um, you know what I'm saying. You, you think, oh, what a good bloke. I, I remember thinking, oh, great, we've got Dean Hallettow. Wow. How did it happen? Yeah, so I'd, end of two, or midway through 2009, I was off contract at the Tigers and I'd been there, um, I debuted in 03, so I'd been there for a long time and I'd played mm. – Jersey, uh, SG ball, Jersey flag, Reg. So I'd been at the club for a long time, loved the club. Um, but I, I felt like I, in particularly in 09, I wasn't playing great. I was a bit stale. I was still playing first grade, but I was kind of running on the spot a little bit with the way I was playing. And um, I thought maybe like, I'd maybe gotten comfortable and um, maybe that was just affecting my approach. And, and I thought – it might be time to, to sort of venture off. And, and, and the Tigers did want to keep me. They, they um, had a chat with me about staying. Um, but uh, the dogs came through really late. I'd almost agreed to terms with the Tigers. And then um, mm. my manager called me up and said, hey, uh, at the time it was uh, Toddy Greenberg and Kevin Moore was a coach. Todd was a CEO. Uh, they want to sit down and have a chat with you. And um, I said, yeah, why not? Let's, let's have a look at it and see, see what happens. And uh, I came and sat down. And I'd, I'd met Todd before when he was working at the stadium 
my manager had introduced me to him previously. So I had a, a little bit of a, an idea of, of him as a person um, and then sat down with Kevy, obviously a name synonymous with the Bulldogs yeah. and, and, and a great guy, Kevy. I got a really good impression sitting down with the both of them uh, and, and they offered me a contract almost the next day and, and it was a contract not too dissimilar to what the Tigers were offering. So it was more a decision like I need, I need a change and I need to stretch myself and I, I like – I always liked what the dogs are about. When I was younger, I was actually a Tigers fan. My brother was a Bulldogs fan, so our house was split, Balmain right. and, uh, and Canterbury. So I thought it would be cool to go, go to a club that um, my brother supported, but also I, I just always loved the way the dogs played. They were a ruthless team mm. for as long as I can remember. Um, playing against them, always ruthless. Obviously won the premiership in 04 with some really good players. Some of those guys were still around and – I thought it would be a great opportunity to to take that on. And there was a very good side coming together then, but it was also a pretty unstable period. And until Des came along, what what, what was that like? Did did you feel as comfortable as you'd hoped, or or could you see that there was you know a, a better period to, coming up for the club? Uh, look, the first, to be honest, my first um, year with the club, I was I was injured quite a bit, and uh, it was not the start I wanted. I wanted to come in, make a good impression, mm. um, cement myself in the side, and and show them why they got me across there. And, and I didn't deliver that in the first year. I was injured for a lot of it. Um, when I came back from injury, I was struggling to get my form back. Um, so we had some patchy times as a group. I was having some 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 rough times as an individual. Mm. So it was quite difficult. Now, 2011 was when, um, unfortunately, Kevin um, left mm. mid-season. I was late in the season. And then Jimmy Dimmick took over. And any anyone that's been around a team where you lose a coach mid, mid-season, it's never a nice place to be. Mm. Um, you feel for the coach themselves personally because that's that's their their job and, and what they care about and what they're doing. And, and you can't question anyone's effort in a head coaching role because it's hard work and a lot of sleepless hours, no <laughs> doubt. So I felt for Kevy. Um, and then we got through the rest of the year, had a little bit of success with Jimmy coaching us. Mm. Desi had signed for 2013, but um, obviously finished 2011. They won the premiership at yeah. the Seagulls and the club said, all right, you can be on your way. Got mm. there and at uh, a year early. Um, and that first period of him being there, we heard a little bit about him. You see a little bit about him from a distance. <laughs> He's just a, a mad scientist who has a really um, strong work, work ethic. And from the moment he stepped through the door, you felt his work ethic. And mm. um, I, I really appreciated that. And I think – it made me work even harder. I always consider myself a hard worker and a, and a professional athlete in terms of the way I approached, the way I did things. But I, I, I felt I had to go to another level to at least meet the way that he worked. Uh, and yeah, I think immediately everyone felt like we, we were moving um, towards something better. I don't know whether it was all of the dogs, but yeah, you finished up with six MCLs. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Or did uh, you not count them? <laughs> there was quite a few. Yeah. I could not blame you for not counting them, but it was was that? So how did you go during the Des period? Was it relatively stable physically for uh, you, even yes. though it was refreshing mentally as well? So I'd had majority of them in my first two years at the club, right. 2010 and 11. I okay. had two surgeries, one at the end of 10, one at the end of 11. End of 11, I was considering um, whether or not I should pull the pin because I'd had just wow. no luck with it. Um, yeah, it's actually Terry Lamb. Um, sort of jolted me back into thinking funnily enough he, he must have caught wind of me talking to it to someone else and um it was in this it was actually here at belmore i was walking out of the training facility and he just called me and asked me how i was doing and then um he said i heard you uh heard you thinking about chucking it in and um i said oh it's like it's just been a tough tough road blah blah and he goes mate you're too young you're t-. and that's all he said to me is you're too young don't don't do that you got lots in front of you and i thought if terry lamb's telling me not to chuck it in like I'm not chucking it in. Like that was like a real light bulb moment having him that, tell, that, tell me to stick with it. That sort of stuff's really interesting because we talk a lot about how important it is to have the old successful players at the club, and um, and and you sort of think about having them up in the grandstand and all that sort of symbolic stuff of watching the success, of seeing the success, and walking past the success in the corridors and reminding you of the the standards and all those things. That's important. And but then some other people say, oh, you know, what's a guy who played in the seventies and eighties going to say to a, a guy who plays in the twenty twenties? I mean, the game's changed. You know, he might be giving him bad, but bad advice. But I think everyone's smart enough to know that no one's talking to you about how we sort of strategize the game these days because a lot of that's changed and the rules have changed. But things like that, 
Just yeah. little things like that that you just spoke of. That's where the value is, isn't it? In a lot of these uh, these experienced players, the legends, still being with clubs. Yeah, 100% it is. And, and like it's he, – he's been – probably one of the greatest ever Bulldogs, right, and over 300 games, number 10. And, and he was a, he's a fantastic player but a, a really good guy, a really good bloke. And you don't get the the list of achievements that he's got without knowing how to approach the game. It's not, mm. not even the skill that he's got or the success that he has in the field or what he knows about the game itself. It's it's about the things that go into becoming a professional full-time footballer. And that's – I go back to Shinji, that's something that he always talked about was mm. understanding what it actually is to be a full-time – Footballer, it's it's not just turning up and getting your paycheck and rolling out to training and going through the motions. It's a, it's about the little things that are that are really important to um, you know developing you as a person. And uh, I think Terry Terry definitely brings that to to the Bulldogs. Um, he's seen it every single. Like he's been around for a long time, right? So he, he's seen it every possible way it could go, wrong or right. And um, you take advice from someone like that any any day of the week. Do you think in twenty twelve? Having won it in 2005, do you think in 2012 the Bulldogs could have done any more than they did? Uh, no, couldn't have, couldn't have done any more than, than what, what we did that year. Um, I, I, I think for myself it was the best year of, of footy that I've played. Right. Um, and I played – this is back to our early conversation. Yeah. I played right second row pretty much for 80% of the season. I got injured in round 20, uh, I think it was, against the Eels, MCL tear. Um, <laughs> And uh, I didn't make it back in the side for the final series. So I was mm. 18th man for every match of the, the final series. Yeah. But as a group, we all bought into what we stood for. Uh, we all bought into what Desi was delivering. Mm. Uh, we were very connected with each other and everyone worked really hard. Again, it's the same It's the same theme, right? Everyone worked really hard on what they needed to do for the group uh, and you trusted each other that everyone was going to bring that on game day. And And – some of the games we played that year, we, we played some amazing football mm. and some guys were on another level in terms of their skill, their execution, and, and that doesn't come without working hard. And um, I, I really thought we were going to march through those finals and, and, and lift a trophy, right? And, yeah. Um, you come up against a side that's just in tune. and <laughs> A great side that had a great game plan on the day that's too. That's right. That's um, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. they'd done their homework. Um I want to ask about the dynamic too. Uh, of course, you played for New Zealand and and very memorably so, very successfully so. World Cup win, um, which hasn't been common uh, for, for Kiwi sides, although there have been a number of them. But, um, Dean, in terms of playing in the NRL and the New Zealand players, is there an importance to have that, that group sort of um, accepted, well looked after. How, how do the New Zealand players, and to, to a lesser extent, we've got, of course, people like James Graham and Luke Thompson. They come from the UK and play. Is there um, is there any necessity to have them fit in, or does just does it happen naturally? Oh, there's probably it, it. It does happen naturally, I guess, to an extent. There's you go to any any club, and most clubs and organisations generally have values and, and behaviours that that they put on their walls and it's good to have things on walls but unless you walk and talk to them every day then yeah. they don't mean anything but any any club that a player goes to if they've got a really good set of values and, and a culture that um, actually walks and lives and breathes then you tend to fit into that I think as a player if you don't if you don't fit into that or at least try and um, understand it and, and bring it every day then um, it makes it really hard um, to integrate with with any sort of side but at the same time, it's important for, for coaches uh, and high-performance managers to understand the type of players that they're working with because if you understand the player that you're working with, you're going to get more out of them when you put them to the torch. Mm. Right? You, you, you want them to, to turn up in, in the worst time and know that they're going to perform for you. And the key to doing that is to, to understanding the player, to showing care for a player. And if you've got players coming from England, you've got players coming from New Zealand, you've got players coming from the Pacific, which is a, a huge yep. – um, proportion of the players we're working with um, in in the game, or we're, we're, they're playing the game at the moment. Then, if, if you don't take the time to get to understand what makes them tick as individuals, then you, you're definitely not going to get them to buy into a team set of values and behaviours and, and what the club culture is about. Because there's always different cliques in in a in a footy team, yeah. no matter what code it is. Because you got the unmarried guys and the married guys, for example. <laughs> then you got the married guys with kids, or the unmarried guys with kids, whatever. You got you got di- and they tend to hang out together because they've got shared experience. Yeah. Um, and those sort of things are great, but you don't want them to become 
too separated, if you know what I mean, that, so that the, the group's still integrated and still working well together and there's no sort of, oh, yeah, those guys, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it, it's all part of the whole management thing, isn't it? Yeah, that's it's natural, right, for, for people to, to – The Kiwis of, will hang out because they've got yeah. a lot, lot, lot in common. That you're right. Married, married guys and, and often talk about kids. I'm sure the guys that don't have a partner <laughs> and don't have kids, yeah. the last thing they want to hear about a training is – yeah. Guys going on about what their kid did on the weekend or their first steps. Like, it's nice, but you know it's just natural for those yeah. groups to sort of start um, lining up with each other and, and having those shared experiences, like you mentioned. But if there's that common that common goal and that common purpose that you are that you mm-hmm. have as a group, that that sort of that thread that runs through every single individual, then um, you know you'll come together as a team and and you'll know the direction you want to head in. And I think having all those different um, perspectives and different experiences just sort of enriches that experience when 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 you know that so many different people are coming together to achieve one common thing it's a it's a really cool experience especially when you're able to to do it on the biggest stage if you're able to win a grand final it's it's so much more gratifying before i let you go two quick things one is on that point how much did it mean to you playing for new zealand especially when you're in a league where of course the the aussies and the kiwis (laughs) play together against each other weekly uh it was um it was an amazing experience. Um, as you can tell by my accent, I've got a very Aussie accent. I've been here, and I mentioned before, I've been here since I was four years yeah. old. But one thing growing up, I've still got my New Zealand passport. And I, and I love it. I consider myself an Australian because I've been here for so long. I love the country and, and it's home. And, and my wife and my kids uh, from here. So I consider myself as much Australian as I am a Kiwi. But I never gave up my passport. My dad drilled into me when we were watching test matches as, as me being a youngster that – I go for the Kiwis. That's that was just it, and they got some some wallopings when I was young. And um, no matter what, I always supported the Kiwis, and I wanted to wanted to be a Kiwi. And uh, it was an unreal experience doing my first haka, doing my first anthem, having my parents in England. My parents came to England for my first Test match against England in two thousand and four. Oh, um, so it was a bit of a surprise. They, they literally rolled into. Um, into Leeds, I was staying in Leeds, got on a train up to Hull and um, to the game within 10 minutes of kickoff, all from like just transit, like Australia really? to um, London. Basically non-stop. Yeah, just non-stop, <laughs> bang, 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 and got there. From, they timed it well. Yeah, and and I, and I didn't know about it. So the club had helped um, sort of organise this. Yeah. The, the Tigers at the time had helped organise it. And I'm um, standing there doing the anthem and, and looking over and seeing my parents in the crowd was, was a pretty special wow. experience. And obviously – like I said, my old man that that had drilled into me that it was we were Kiwis, we support the Kiwis, and they're Fair enough wearing the jersey. It was uh, it was the best, yeah, the best experience. We've just had Anzac round, and you played in an Anzac team. What was all that about? Yeah, so the same the same year in two thousand and four, there was uh, a group of guys from both. It was a Tri Nation series, so England, Australia, and, and New Zealand, and there was a group of guys from both the Australian and New Zealand team that um, weren't getting a lot of game time, so they decided to. Bring us together and form an Anzac team, for want of a better word. It was yeah. an Australian New Zealand um, team brought together all the guys that needed some game time. Um, and I actually roomed um, with Brent Tate. Um, we were roomies. Um, and funny, he, I put on a movie, actually, it was a scary movie, and he put his head under the pillow. Do you want to watch a scary movie? Turn it off, turn it off. <laughs> There's a bit of a scaredy cat, Tatey. Um, but we had guys like uh, Mark O'Mealy was in the squad. Yeah, uh, Paul Rahi he was uh, with from the Kiwi Great contingent. Great player for the dogs. Yeah. Um, who else? Brett Kamali was was the halfback. Yep. And um, our coaches were James Lulawai and Craig Bellamy. They were our wow, coaches. Right. So we played up in Cumbria against the Cumbria team, and we 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 got a good good result. We won, I think, it was sixty to ten or something like that. But um, <laughs> yeah, it was just cool to to mix and mingle with the opposition yeah. <laughs> from from that that Tri Nations and and to get the uh, the chance to wear a combined jersey it was split down the middle. They had. Have you still got it? I, I do have it somewhere. I think it's at my mum's place. Let's um, hang on to that because I don't think there'd be anything quite yeah, like it. Yeah, it was. It was pretty else. random. It wasn't the most attractive thing to look at. It had um, black with a white V on one side and green with a, a gold V on the other side. So it was um, an interesting thing. And we had actually the shorts were like white with green like quarters. Or it was. It was pretty. When pretty you tackled, did you tackle on the New Zealand side or the <laughs> which shoulder did you take? Just cut? tried to make the tackles however I could. Uh, but yeah, it was it was a great experience. As I said, I got to play with some wonderful players. I got to see Ogo rub some um, deep heat into his head before the game. That was a good experience. Yeah. Did yeah. he do that himself? Yeah, he did it himself. Like that was his one of his rev ups. Interesting guy, the preparation that he must go through to get up for games. We missed him this week. We will get him on the show. Don't worry. I'm sure he's got some fascinating stories. Um, but anyway, 
Mate, it's so good to have you um, still connected, obviously, with the club. We really appreciate that. But more importantly, connected very closely through the NRL to Rugby League. And uh, like I said, uh, one of the great blokes to have played for the Bulldogs. And we're very proud to have had him, had him on board. And his contributions to this club have been amazing. But thanks for joining us today on Bulldogs Unleashed. Pleasure. Thanks for having me, Bill. We'll be back to do it again next week.